The commentary describes three stages of concentration, momentary, neighborhood, and fixed penetration. The way it explains these has to do with Gesenna practice, but the terms have been adopted for other types of concentration as well. And because these terms are not explained in the canon, the different Ajans have come up with various ways of describing them. One common one is to say that momentary concentration is your ordinary, everyday concentration where you listen to someone speak and you can follow the meaning of that person's words. You can read a book, make sense out of what you're reading, as long as you stay with the topic. But it keeps on relapsing, and you have to keep on renewing it. Neighborhood concentration is when you let go of your everyday concerns, and you're beginning to settle in with the object of meditation, but it's not fully secure. There's a drifting quality. It's only when you can reach fixed penetration that you're really one with the object. And that's when you're safe in your concentration. You're alert, energized, still. The type of concentration that's ready for discernment. It's in that intermediate stage that drowsiness can set in. This is where sloth and torpor as a hindrance can come in as well. And because it's an inevitable stage in the concentration, you have to prepare so that you don't drift off. As one of the John says, this is the stage of concentration where you're able to put up with a little bit of pain, but you fall off for pleasure. In other words, you lose your topic of concentration and you focus instead on the pleasure that's beginning to arise. And you zone out. This is why John Lee would have you start the meditation with long, deep in and out breaths to energize yourself. And why the Buddha describes steps in the concentration where you do work, because it's working with your concentration that's going to get you through this section. Evaluating the breath, spreading the breath around. These are John Lee's techniques. The Buddha would have you spread your awareness throughout the whole body. And the effort of spreading your awareness and keeping it spread, that's one thing that can help keep you awake, keep you from drifting off. So know that you have to go through this minefield before you settle down and be prepared. Sometimes you find that staying with the breath is not enough to keep you awake, even if you're trying to keep your awareness filling the body. This is why the Buddha says if you find yourself drifting off with a particular topic of concentration, don't make much of that topic. In other words, find something else. Either you change the way you breathe or you change to another contemplation. You can try imagining the bones in the body. Start with the tips of the fingers, all the bones in the first joints, and then move up to the second joints and third joints. Try to have a sense of the feeling where you are focused on those bones, and then relax that part of the body, and then work up through the hands, through the wrists, through the arms, the shoulders, and then start down at the feet and work up through the legs, up the spine. You can think about death. Death could come at any time, and you don't want it to come where you're nodding off. There's work to be done. You can think about the Buddha. Anything that helps keep the mind focused on a Dharma topic and energizes you. These are the things you do in preparation. There are also things you can do when you find yourself drifting off, in spite of your first efforts. This is where you have to be firmly on the side of not drifting off and not falling asleep. Because there's a part of the mind that will say, these are the signs I'm tired. 
I need my rest. And you just go for it. So remind yourself, no one has slept their way to awakening. And the mind has its tricks. It's not always the case that drowsiness is a sign that you really do need rest. So you've got to test it. Sometimes it comes on because an important insight is about to come to the surface. And there's a part of the mind that doesn't want to deal with it, doesn't want to see it. And it will divert your attention by making you drift off. So as signs of sleepiness come on, signs of drowsiness, remember you can't always trust them. Don't be too quick to side with them. The Buddha recommends chanting if you can chant. If you can't chant out loud, you're sitting in a group like this. Then if there's any chant that you have memorized, run it through in your mind. Rub your limbs. If you need to, get up and go out and do some walking meditation. Go up and look at the stars if it's nighttime. Refresh yourself. And if it turns out that even while you're walking, you're falling asleep, it's a sign that okay, you do need rest. But you make up your mind that you will lie down and rest, and you will get up as soon as you wake up again. You don't just bury yourself in the sleep. Now, there are other techniques as well. And oftentimes, it's good to come up with your own. There was a period when John Fuin was really sick. And oftentimes, I would just stay up with him many hours of the night. He made a comment one time. When he was younger, he'd had really bad headaches. And it gotten so bad that he needed to have monks stay with him when he woke up. They gave him compresses, do this, do that. And one night he happened to wake up, and all the monks who were there, supposedly watching over him, were asleep, and he found himself watching over them. The thought occurred to him, who's looking after whom here? Well, he said that to me one time, and I realized that was a message. If I was going to be looking after him, he didn't want me lying there when he needed someone at night. So there'd be nights when I'd just set up all night, just in case he needed me. Or I'd make a vow. If I did lie down to rest, if he needed me, I wanted to wake up five minutes before he needed me. And it worked. But one of the lessons I learned about drowsiness was one time when I had it, when I had a part of the day when I was responsible for looking after him, there were other monks there at the time who could look after him too. But one by one, the different monks found reasons why they had to work on a construction project, working on other things around the monastery. So I found myself taking on this monk's two hours and that monk's two hours until I had the 2 a.m. to 8 p.m. shift. Just a few hours to rest, and then it was 2 a.m. had to get up, look after him. And after several weeks of this, I was really sleep deprived. And getting up at 2 a.m. did not guarantee that I was really going to be awake during those hours. I'd be sitting there and nodding off. And I discovered that if working with the breath, if I tried to stay at one spot, I was sure to go to sleep. So I decided. Okay, three breaths at the tip of the nose, three breaths at the base of the throat, three breaths in the middle of the chest, down through all the spots that John Lee mentions in Method 2, and then back up again. Three breaths, three breaths. And simply the fact that I had to count the breaths in addition to focusing on the breath, and then I had to move, was able to wake me up. So a large part of this is being on the side of wakefulness and not on the side of wanting to rest, and then trying to find techniques, the techniques that work ahead of time to prevent the sleepiness from coming on. And if it does come on, 
while the mind is beginning to settle down. What you can do to keep the mind active. That's the important principle. Give the mind work to do here in the body or with some other dharma topic. And experiment to see what works for you. The fact that you're actually discovering something on your own makes it all that more interesting. Because that's the real key to overcoming sleepiness, is to find something that has your interest, something you can explore. And taking on sleepiness as an opponent instead of as your nightly friend gives you a lot to explore and a lot to discover. This is the basic principle with all the hindrances, that you'll learn about them through resisting them, to trying to outwit them, to get around them. And in the course of learning about them, you'll learn a lot about your own mind. And you reaffirm the original principle for why you're meditating to begin with. Which is that you do really want to master this, this concentration, the type of concentration that can lead to discernment. After all, we're not here to drift off. We're here to get firmly established. And those are two very different things, even though they're both quiet. They're quiet in radically different ways.